everybody. Welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. I'm Spencer Martin, author of the Beyond the Peloton newsletter. I'm here with Andrew Vance of the Choose the Hard Way podcast, thebetterlab.io. Andrew, we're going to discuss the, the world champion I, the multiple road race world championships last week, what it means. Are we all, is Tade Pogacar, is he going to be president? Like what's happening here? He's, he's winning everything. And then also your passion, the gravel world championships coming up this week. And you're going to educate us about what it is, who is in it. Information that's not that easy to track down, but do you want to plug anything before we get going? Spencer, if you want to be at your absolute peak for that next bus stop ride or Rafa, Rafa, Rafa gravel ride out there in Boulder on Saturdays, which I hear gets a little bit spicy, you know that you need to get great sleep. Doing that on your own can be hard. That's why you should go download the Better Lab app today and the Apple App Store. We help you mindfully build science back practices to sleep better that stick. The, the app is live. It's in the Apple App Store. If you've tried wearables, if you've filled your head with thousands of hours of podcast content about sleep and you find, hey, I'm not actually doing the stuff that improves my sleep, we're the app for you. We help you actually put that information into action, get it done and be consistent so you can get great sleep and be the exceptional human that I know you are. Check us out. Andrew, I don't have a ton of time today, but that's good because there's not a ton to say about the World Road Race Championships. Today, Pogacar attacked from even further out than I thought, 100K to go. I don't even think he meant, I, I think he did not think that he would be alone. Like he looked disappointed when he was dropping everyone. Like what is going on? Quinn Simmons, what's your problem? Why can't you stand my wheel? He didn't look under like pressure at all. For some reason, Remco Evenepoel is like in the back of the group. I still don't understand what happened there. Matthew Vanderpool doesn't respond. That's a little, that's a little bit more understandable because of Vanderpool, the fact that he even finished third on that course is incredibly impressive. It was the hardest course, the best he's ever done on a course that hard, if that makes sense. So you could understand that, you know, he could roll the dice perhaps and say, well, maybe this comes back together and maybe I want to sprint, but I can't be following the world's best climber a hundred kilometers out. But then again, he probably could have, and that would have been his best chance of winning. So the fact that they were so far back at that point, Pogacar's running out of teammates, by the way. He's actually in a little bit of a, of a tough spot if he doesn't attack, which is why he recognized that and did attack. Super impressive. But I am, we'll talk about also like the fact that he's won basically every race he's done. And not only that, I was trying to think kilometers that he was even put under pressure or like wasn't able to ride the pace he wanted to ride are far and few between in this entire year. But what was your take on that? Why? What happened there? Is he just that much better than everybody else that they're like, yeah, no, we have to sit in the group because it's 100 kilometers from the finish line. We, we can't be attacking. And then today it's just like, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to fly up the front here. That was my exact read. The thing that I wondered when I saw that happen was, are we going to get to a point where we see Jonas in the mix in some of these races? Is no. he gonna, Oh, come think. on. He doesn't come have on. a dent. He's not a one day guy. He's not. Well, I mean, they did say that he's going to race worlds next year. I mean, it's a bit early to be saying that, but they did say, hey, he's going to be on the team next year. He wants to do these races. The proof is in the pudding. We'll see if he actually shows up on the starting line. It's a long year leading up to the 2025 worlds. Will he be there? <laughs> so he's won, actually. He has won a one day race in his life. I just filtered out. He's won one one day race, the Drome Classic, an early season French race. Mm. Actually, a pretty hard race. It's a good one. We beat some good riders. 2022 beat Juana Yuso, probably a 12 year old Juana Yuso. But yeah, I mean, we do. You're, you're, you're like barking up the right tree. We, the only person that could really follow today is, is Jonas. And then that's the only rider that, think about this. How many times has today Pogacar attacked and not won, if that makes sense? Like, how many times has he been reeled in? from one of these attacks. The only occurrence I can think of is when Jonas mowed him down on stage 11 of the tour this year and beat him in that sprint. There might be only one guy capable of following him and it's Jonas Vendigo. I mean, it is a mountainous, high altitude world championships next year. So I wouldn't be surprised if he was there. He's just, it's, it's kind of funny. I mean, I guess it was the norm for a long time. The, the Grand Tour winners didn't really win a lot of one day races and he doesn't even really race them and when he does he doesn't even tend to finish them but you have to imagine i mean he does well like a grand tour stage is a bike race you'd have to imagine just like hey man stay at the front follow see that guy follow his wheel 
when he attacks, you follow him. I'd imagine Vinigo would have done pretty well. Part of the reason today had to attack is the course. I kept having this argument with people, including Johan Bernil, leading up to the race. It's like, it's not that hard. We know it's a lot of climbing, but it's not that hard. I'm like, that's like saying, like, well, if I sip my drinks, I can drink a lot, but I won't get drunk. It's like, well, the alcohol is still getting in your body. Like, you have to do the climbing. But they were right that there wasn't a lot of sustained climbing. And we saw that in the women's race where Demi Vollering attacked late and the climbs were not long enough and hard enough to let you leverage your superior climbing fitness. That's the reason Demi Vollering couldn't get away and found herself in a tough spot losing the sprint. That would have happened to Pogacar had he waited, you know, tried to drop Vanderpool on the last lap. He probably wouldn't have. So, or he would have gotten reeled in at the finish. Like, because it was like 20K of downhill, basically. So it looked crazy that he was attacking that far out, but it actually made a lot of sense and probably maximized his chances of winning. My big question is, have you noticed in like every race, basically, every big race, the man who attacks first wins, will we just see people attacking from the gun? Like, is that the answer here? Remco Evenepoel just attacks kilometer zero every race now to try to get out in front of Pogacar. It's a good topic that we're going to be talking about when we get to the Goat Path World Championships, which are happening this weekend in Belgium, which we'll be talking about in a moment. I think the answer is yes, we'll see people attacking earlier and earlier. And I think perhaps an even larger question that I know we've discussed privately and now for the first time we're ready to take it public. When we think about what happened at the Men's World Championship and Instagram Remco Evenepoel, the flexor of double gold medals, the wearer of the storied gold helmet. When we reflect back on his biggest victories at which today was not present, would he have actually won any of those races had today been there? Well, well this is let's get out a time machine is, and you can only race the, you can only race the people who, sh- who show up. And also, are we? Is, does Remco have the capacity to ever beat Peak today? That's the question. Probably. I mean, probably not. I, he doesn't really ever beat him. I, people talk about them as other rivals. How many times has he beaten him? It was that one race in Australia, the 2022 World Championships, which he, which he did win with today there. So I guess that answers your question. He would have won that World Championship had today been there. It was in Australia. No one really cared about it. Today was focused on... He had finished a tour, disappointing tour, focused on Lombardia, didn't didn't do that well. Got 19th at that World Road Race Championship, set, which looks crazy now. You're like, what happened, man? How did you not win a race? But Remco does not beat today Pogacar often, it, if at all. He's, he's not the same level of rider. I know that could be hard for some people to hear. He's very good. He's probably the second or third best rider in the world. He's not nearly as good as today Pogacar. And part of the reason is it lies back in that Peter Atia interview. Today's superpower, secret power, is that he is very light naturally, like around 65 kilos, but also very strong. So if you know his zone two is 340 on a climb, his threshold's probably 460. That's like a that's like a big Perry Roubaix winners FTP. You know, maybe like Wout Van Aert, maybe Filippo Ghana, maybe Vanderpool are slightly above that, but not too far above that. And he's so light. So someone like Remco Evenepoel is, I believe, quite a bit lighter than Teddy Pogacar and relies on aerodynamics to get the high average speeds where today is just so light, so strong. It, it's hard for really anyone to go head to head with him when he go when he breaks away on a hilly course like we saw. Like, what are you going to do? He can ride over seven watts per kilo in the climbs. And then he can settle back down below threshold at like 400 watts in the flats, you know, just like getting that heart rate back down to 120, 130 before he hits the climb again. It makes him very hard to stop. Yeah, Remco is not, yeah, he's not there. He's not that guy, if that makes sense. It's, he, but, but you don't, you don't necessarily have to be like no one is. The more you look into Tate Pogacar's season, he, he's potentially, I know Eddie Merckx claims this isn't the case. He's probably the best rider of all time. Because he won the, the treble, the triple crown, which I feel like we just kind of made up this season, the Giro Tour World Championship triple. So two other people have done it. Stephen Roach, 1987. Eddie Merckx, 1974. I'm doing this no notes, so I hope I'm right. Eddie Merckx in 1974 <laughs> wins the Giro by 12 seconds. You'd say that's not a convincing victory. 
He, he won the tour, but I think he got dropped on a few tough mountain stages. So not as dominant as this season from today. And then in 87, Stephen Roach, I mean, he was, he was not dominating either. He won those races, incredible season, but he didn't do it with the same level of, it, it's just over when that guy attacks. Like I'm looking, he lost San Remo. So he gets third in San Remo. Oh, Sprinter's Classic to the world's best runner. He loses stage one of Catalonia. He gets second because he starts attacking too late and an Israel Premier Tech rider holds him off. I forget whose name it was. That was a two-day stretch where he didn't win a race and he raced. That might have been his worst stretch of the season. And then I'm also looking Tour de France, washed up Pogacar. He finishes second on the stage seven time trial, second on stage 11. Those are the, the two stages that he attempted to win consecutively. That legitimately is probably his worst stretch of the season. Two second places in a week in a tour to front in tour to front stages, and then after that, he doesn't. Ha- I don't think he has a single race that he tried to win that he did not win. I guess you could say GP Quebec again. That's kind of a sprinter's race. That it's even amazing he was in a position to win, and then he had the Giro d'Italia stage. If you remember when George Steinhauser won stage seventeen, he wasn't even really trying to win that though, and he got second. So. Those would be the races that he tried to win and did not win all season long. I've never seen someone do this, just be able to call a shot. And like to put this into perspective, he has 29, I believe like 29 wins, no, 23 wins this year. I think that's almost the same number of race starts that Matthew Vanderpool has throughout the whole season. And when Vanderpool has these great seasons, Vanderpool, I was just daydreaming like Perry Roubaix next year, Pogacar versus Vanderpool. Who's going to win? You know, Vanderpool's pretty good at Roubaix. But it starts to really come into focus how much better today is when you, like Vanderpool last year, I believe he won four races. They were all, all four of them were big, but he's not, a, he does not win in these clusters of 20, 30 wins per year. Like this is, if not unprecedented, not something we've ever seen in the modern era. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. In fact, no one wins in clusters of 25 or 30. I do have to wonder, you throw SBT long course into the mix do we have a different result? And I, you know, you mentioned the 2022 worlds. I, (laughs) it's absolutely wild how much the world of professional cycling has changed since 2022. And again, as you noted, and we've discussed many times now, we did see a diminished field and level of competition at the worlds in 2022. That is when we were at absolute peak Vanderpool. There was of course the TikTok hotel incident that ruined his race and looking at the results from this race and riders who finished in front of today. And and by the way, since the stunning revelation that it's pronounced today, not Tade, I don't know about you. I've had so many like who's on first type conversations with my kids and other people who are like today, 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 today. but hold on. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's today, today, Pagacha. Anyway, we had people finishing in front of today in 2022, including Nielsen Palace, who's a great writer. It's not a writer I, I think of as someone who's going to frequently finish in front of today in a one day race. And just like going up towards the top of the results list, I don't know if you remember a Slovakian phenom who won many races in his day. He goes by the name of Peter Sagan. He likes to make party. And he's now retired. But we had Sagan in seventh, Bling, Mike, Michael Matthews in third place. Christoph hey, he, Laporte. He's still doing it. He's still no, doing no, it. He I GP know. Quebec. Yeah, Bling, Bling's looking good. I'm just saying, these are not riders you think would have a snowball's chance against today, today. <laughs> today, today, they would not even touch today. Right. That was a weird world championships, we should say. Anytime you do it, that far afield, you get odd results because not not that Remco winning is an odd result, but just the fact that major players like weren't even really contending for the win. You know, who knows? Maybe he didn't get upgraded. Maybe he had to fly economy that whole way, like Scott McGill. He was he was slamming hoagies. He was not the legs were not shaking <laughs> had, out when he, he had when two he Jersey Mike's footlongs in his bag. Yeah, yeah, which is a pro move. You get on some of those planes and you think, oh man, I don't know if I want to eat anything. And then you're on there for. For yeah, half a half a day. So you should be you should be having those Jersey Mike subs. Just hope you don't get yeah. sick. 
that could be a disaster. You, you mentioned an interesting thing about Nielsen Palace. I want to talk about him a little bit later. So we'll wrap up this world's talk. Let me talk. Oh, about I did. Hold on. I did. I did want to say one other thing about worlds. To me, the the absolute greatest ride of the world championships. Yes, today is, I guess, the breakaway. He had the greatest ride. I almost equally impressive to me, honestly, was Chloe Digert's ride. She had a ride that I mean, she really pulled a rabbit out of a hat. We were talked on the last episode about where goes Chloe Digert. She had a number of very severe wrecks in the past couple of years, been in and out of competition, recovering from very major injuries, one of which was sustained at the time trial world championships a few years ago when she lost a large chunk of her thigh in a high speed downhill turn in wet conditions. And just to see her claw herself back into the main group from a very challenging position in this women's world championship road race and then take second in the sprint was impressive. Yeah, super impressive. That is, I wanted to mention her before we move on. She could have won the race. Yeah. I mean, she's so talented. I, I was touched talking to someone the other day. I hope that this ride gives her confidence that she should be at the front because that's honestly her only problem right now. Is right. She's ill-positioned at times. She kind of, she's had a somewhat strange post-race interview where she was like, oh, I was even having hard a hard time wanting to do this race. Like it seems like it's challenging for her at times to get over the mental hurdle of, you know, and I think anyone who's competed has had this feeling sometimes where you're at a race and you're not locked in. You're thinking, I don't even want to do this. You just have this pit feeling in your stomach. Hopefully this result gets her back to the mental level where she thinks she can win any race she does because she can, like she's that strong. It's also crazy that the U S women win the Olympics, finish second at world championships with two different riders. And if you ask me right now, I hope this isn't offensive to anyone. You ask me right now, who's the stronger between the two? I don't know if I would have an answer. It's, po it's possible that Kristen Faulkner is the Olympic world road race, or Olympic, yo, road race champion, and isn't even the strongest rider on her own team. Like that's how deep the U S women are and how good Chloe Dygert is on that race. I've never seen anything quite like that, where you had Marina Voss up the road, like talk right. about a, a slam dunk, small group sprinter, <laughs> like, like a, it's a layup for her. Her teammate, Demi Volering realizes, oh crap, I might not win this race and just starts attacking behind a, a breakaway with her own teammate in it. And I know their national teams are not real teammates. So that's potentially what's like, she doesn't really care about the Dutch winning, but even just selfishly, you don't have to do that, Demi. That's not your responsibility. Let other people attack, and then you can try to counterattack off them. Demi Volering just gets on the front, starts riding hard. Like, there's no Pogachar snap the elastic here. It's just, I'm just going to get on the front and ride hard. I'm going to drop everybody. Well, the climb's not hard enough. She pulls everybody, including Lado Kopecky, up to, up to Voss, drops Voss. Voss is like five meters behind, struggling to stay on. Volering's just on the front hammering, not letting her own teammates. The only person she is dropping, there's a famous like inside the car, I think video clip from the 2009 tour where Johan's like, you're only hurting your own teammates, Contador, because he's attacking and dropping Cloden. But it's like, that's like, she's only dropping her own teammate. Like, what is she doing here? And then, of course, she ice, she get, they go from having six riders in the front group to, to one. And she's in a group of really strong sprinters and then gets smoked in the sprint. Like she was never going to win that sprint. Kind of unbelievable that that happened. Like I actually don't, she, it just seemed like she panicked and was like, oh, I'm not going to win the world championships. I have to go. And I mean, that kind of takes me onto the point. Like I know Demi Volering has technically won races this year. Like she's, she's crushing races without the top riders, like tour of Switzerland. Let, let me check who got second there. Yeah. It's, it was not top riders. Volta Burgos. She crushes. It's Zulia Tour of Basque Country Women. She crushes, but not the top riders there. Tour of Spain, Volta España Women. She crushes, not the top riders there. These races with the top riders like Liege Best on Liege, Flush Wallone, Amso Gold, Tour of Flanders, Strada Bianchi, World Championships. She doesn't win. She strikes out the whole year. And this is like her biggest year from a publicity perspective. Signs the big Nike deal, is trying to be a, a breakout star outside of cycling. She feels like she, maybe I might have said this in another show. Now I'm having, I'm doing so many podcasts. I don't remember what I've said where, but it feels like she's feeling the pressure a bit. Like, oh, I have to win worlds. 
I'm just going to attack now instead of thinking strategically about it. I, right. I was really shocked to see that play out. Actually, it was just objectively one of the most interesting finishes to a race I've seen in a long time. Yeah, it was. I loved it. It was a hell of a race, and I love seeing Chloe claw her way back. And yeah, it in a different way was much more exciting than, than the men's yeah. race and kind of yes. watching watching the mess behind today. Although I have to say, something that was notable about that attack from a hundred kilometers out during the race, it looked to me like we were actually seeing today fatigue which we don't often see <laughs> so that that was interesting and then ex post facto when he characterized his attack as stupid and then everyone else in the peloton said the same thing i just kept thinking you know the correct strategy is the one that wins the race so i'm not i'm not sure it was a stupid move it was the move that won the race yeah i thought that was overplayed a little bit of course he was fatiguing he'd been off yeah. the front for 100 kilometers and he didn't think I don't, he, he, did, he did have you know 165 mil cranks though so he's spinning yeah yeah he's, he's not spinning. even you're not even fatiguing at that at that level of rpm but the thing about i that i felt like wasn't covered wasn't talked about in the commentary the genius of that move Within 20 kilometers, the, the group is broken down behind. Remco's attacking people, yelling at people. Like, that's what is in your corner as the solo rider off the front. Like, okay, sure, they were getting closer to him. They were never going to catch him because the close, it's like dividing a number by two, hoping to get the zero. The closer you get to that rider, the less people will work and the more they'll look for other people to, to finish off the job. And it gets harder and harder and harder to catch him. You even saw like the only time they got really close is when they were chasing Healy. It was, I mean, talk about two great rides, Ben Healy and Tom Schweens, the two yeah. guys who have gotten second behind today and in big one-day races recently. Like, they're, they're pros at knowing how to rip off the front of a group and get second behind today. But that was really the impetus to close the group. They, clo they closed down today, no, sorry, Tom's and Ben Healy, and they were, like, kind of close to today. But as soon as that happens, they start attacking each other again. Vanderpool's attacking, Remco's attacking, they can't get away. And then the gap went back out and he wins by, um, he has like almost a minute in, ahead of Vanderpool. We should mention Ben O'Connor gets second. Oh, yeah. Holy smokes that I not right. see that coming. I did say like in yeah. my preview newsletter, you should like just looking at the data, you should look at riders in the top 10 of the UCI points rankings and Ben O'Connor was in there. And I was like, that's kind of weird. Like, that's funny to imagine him winning this race. He gets second. I got to say, is decathlon, is that a silly move to let him go in retrospect? The guy is ranked number six in the PCS points rankings for all riders in the world, and he's walking to Jayco. That's, that doesn't look as good now. I think that this is a classic divorce phenomenon where <laughs> he's got no hair. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think he, he's excited about where he's going next, and I think he probably feels mentally refreshed. And does the team regret the breakup and going through this divorce yeah they regret it <laughs> and he's going to thrive somewhere else probably 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 we'll see, you know we'll see we'll, we'll see i mean if you if you're a really shrewd front office guy you'd say this is probably the best season he's ever going to have you know he's probably yeah. not going to replicate this at jacob so you know, well i'm just i mean the first thing i think about is caleb ewan's season this year well well, Caleb Ewan was in, having the worst season of his life before he went to Jayco. Yeah, but I, I think, thought it, I did think at the outset I was somewhat optimistic this would be a season of renewal for Caleb, and I I do still believe in my heart of hearts, Spencer. If I'm going to be open with you in this this sacred space, I still think we're going to see a Caleb Ewan comeback. I think it's going to be Cavendish esque. It might take a long time. He will rise again, and he will win stages at Grand Tours. That's my prediction. But yeah, until then, rough ride in the short term, grim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No comment. Let's move forward. Brandon McNulty wins a, a stage of the <laughs> Tour of Croatia Crow Race. It just reminded me of like the tough spot this guy is in. Like such a good rider, just has a hard time getting starts on that team. And then I, you mentioned Nielsen Palace. I was thinking, when's the last time Nielsen Palace won a race? He hasn't won a race all year. And he's a good rider, like legitimately good. We're talking like physically up there with Matteo Jorgensen, up there with Brendan McNulty. Yeah. Just feels like he's, I just don't fully understand his role at EF. Like at the tour, they just had him kind of in breakaways, but just seemed like he was in breakaways to help Ben Healy win stages or Richard Carapaz win stages. It's, it's actually been a little depressing to watch him 
almost atrophy as a race winner on that team. Go from someone with so much promise to just being like breakaway fodder, a satellite rider for Richard Carapaz. It's it's not great. I'm, I hope things turn around next year. I frankly, speaking of changing teams, like he would be a guy that I think would really benefit from changing teams. Has he ridden on any team but EF? That's kind of, it's where he's... Well, if you remember this, the real the real Palace fans remember he rode for Visma. He oh, was wow. in their feeder program and Whoa. didn't like it because he said they didn't let you eat food. And he oh, was having a hard that's, time that's feeling not good. good and powerful. And if you've ever looked at that team, you would agree with him that they probably don't eat a lot of food because they're all very skinny. Well, that's, that must have been the same era as Alexi Vermeulen, who I believe was in their Aspar program, right? Yeah, he might have been on the he's on the senior team too. Maybe twenty eighteen. Hold on. A yeah, yeah, you're right. Alexi Vermeule. I know. I, I mean, they were not wow. the team they are now. Okay, they were this kind was of like in, a dead end I, team. At the forgetting time. the age of these guys. Yeah, this. Yeah, Alexi signed. Oh my god! Yeah, he was on in 2016, 2017. Yeah, that's just wild. Whoa! Wow, time flies, huh? Whoa! I guess twenty sixteen. That makes sense. That was. When the Warriors blew the, that's when they came down. They were down three one. This is not relevant. It's only relevant because I remember being in a hotel room with a bunch of cyclists watching the Warriors come back from three one down to the OKC Thunder to only lose the title to the Cavs after being up three one. And they were talking about Alexi Vermeil and getting signed for Lotto in L Yumbo. But Andrew, let's let you cook a few minutes on Gravel right. World Championships. When is it? Where is it? What is it? Who's doing it? Doesn't matter. Everybody's doing it. If who's doing it, it was pretty hard to find out until very hard. Yeah, two days ago. And then the start list was released. You will not find it on the official UCI site. <laughs> you will find it it's on not on such, Pro such, such, chats, is it? No, it's not. You'll it's find it in weird. such places as Cycling Up to Date, which is one of my mm -hmm. new favorite aggregator sites, as well as I think Grand Fondo Daily the ever popular Grand Fondo Daily. And this start list has many human beings on it. There are nearly 300 riders in the men's professional race. As you'll remember, Spencer, and as I'm sure many residents of Boulder, Colorado are probably currently in Belgium because the age group Gravel World Championships will take place over this coming weekend as well. So it's one of those great celebrations of elite cycling at all levels. This is happening in Belgium and in Leuven. Beautiful yeah. town, by the way. If you yeah. remember, had the Road Worlds not that long ago. That was when Al Philippe won one of Yeah. Them. And the parkour, I would say, is not too dissimilar from a road classic, actually. This is not the gravel that the American listeners probably associate with the discipline spencer and i have both taken in a preview of the course from previous choose the hard way and beyond the peloton guest cameron mason who will be there racing for scotland he's there he was there previewing the course he of course is now an alpeson de kunick development writer so he was previewing the course with matthew vanderpool and his other teammates and the course to me had the look spencer of Primitive goat path is probably how I would characterize it. So, but a very buff goat path. So probably in most places, just wide enough for two riders. This will be televised or streaming on flow this weekend, the men's and women's races, I believe at 8 a.m. Eastern time, both Saturday and Sunday. And as you pointed out, Spencer, it's likely to be the case that by the time the stream starts, the conclusive move that wins the race will have happened. And my prediction is that this move will likely happen in the first 10 kilometers of the race. And the way the UCI is gridding riders for these starts is similar to cyclocross. And these UCI gravel races, grid position is critical and it determines the outcome of the race because they are held on such narrow buff courses. If you're not in the top 20 on the grid, I, you may not even want to start the race, which is probably why we didn't see some of America's greatest gravel stars make it to this race because the grid is set based on UCI points. 
There are many world tour riders, including Matthew Vanderpool and others who will Mate Mahorich, defending champion. So they'll be gridded up front and good luck getting within spitting distance of their wheel if you are not someone who has many, many UCI road points. And it's UCI road points, correct? There's not yeah. some like UCI gravel. Yeah. So this well, is- there is a UCI gravel series, but somehow if you're a world tour road pro, they're putting you in front. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, we didn't talk about this and I don't want to spend any time on it. I'll spend maybe 20 seconds on it. A lot of ink being spilled right now about the Matthew Vanderpool bunny hop and the world championship men's road race. We have seen people DQ'd from races. There's a UCI rule. You can't go on to sidewalks or off the course and American pro Danny Summerhill, of course, famously disqualified from a crit this summer for bunny hopping. A and that's curb. the most controversial thing he's ever done. Yeah. 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 Uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that, Spencer. <laughs> but with Matthew Vanderpool, there's a lot of debate about, oh, like, would they have, you know, he's only getting away with it because he's Matthew Vanderpool. Yes, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's, yes. Your, that's right. Yes. Do you think the, the UCI has some just organization of course is getting away with it they're not going to dq matthew vanderpool well it would look bad i mean he did break the rules it was dangerous he should he shouldn't have done that there was people right on that sidewalk he could have plowed like imagine like it could be a little kid there you just plow into him yeah 30 miles an hour the kid could die easily i mean there was a kid right in his path but yeah if you if you dq him it, like most people don't it's not like a soccer match or something where there's an obvious red card it's like how many people even saw that in the moment and then you dq them it just right it's it's not flu, it's not a fluid dq and yeah if they don't give him first start at this race he's not showing up if you say hey you're your 50th he's just oh not yeah gonna come. and if he wasn't in this race would i watch it I, but i would say this here's my gripe with gravel worlds i've watched two editions the only two editions I'm Mr. Gravel World Championships. I've never seen even a moment that I really remember. Because as you say, the race is always over by the time the TV coverage starts. And then you're just watching. You're like, well, this is, it seems to be a man off the front. Matt Mahorich is riding to the finish line. On that, on that, to counter my own point, I'm excited that it's in Belgium. I, this is like, it's in the heartland of cycling in Flanders. It should be a good atmosphere. It's kind of, it's going to be interesting to watch gravel be introduced to the heartland of cobbled cycling but it it's been in northern italy and the courses have been good like it's 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 nice to go ride in the veneto i don't think the the fan interest has been there have you been watching those last two editions thinking "Hmm, does anyone in this town know that this race is even happening It, it feels a bit like a local race that we might do yeah it definitely has vibe it I, it doesn't really have that no pressure no diamonds flair that some of the bigger American events yeah. such as BWR Lawrence are known for, and in fact that's something that I thought when I was watching Cameron Mason's preview. Of course, Belgium global epicenter of cycling, it it does have the look from a terrain point of view. I feel like this could happen in Missouri. Yes, it's the the irony of gravel a lot of times where you're doing these races in these exotic locales and it looks a bit like is this on the katie trail like what's going on yeah what i feel like i've done this race before but i'm coming in with an open will i watch the race absolutely i I do think it conflicts today pagacha races on he races at the Giro del Emilia. Is that on Saturday? that's got to if it's italian it's got to be on saturday so be ready for that folks that's going to be a good race but out that this is probably my second most race I'm second most excited about this weekend. I fully expect Matthew Vanderpool to win. I would be shocked if he didn't. I if I was gonna pick someone outside of that, Peter Vacock, keep an eye on him. That guy's good. Seriously yeah. good. This would be his time to shine too. This means a lot to to him. Like to show that he's not just been out here doing this gravel thing for fun, that it, it he's actually very good at it and these are serious races. And of course, we've discussed this. One of the other significant riders who will be on the start line, we of course have former Gravel World Champion Gianni Vermeersch and Luke Lamperti. Trying to top those big wins at Tulsa Tough will be on the start would, line. This would this even top it if he were to win? I would uh, say, yeah. I think Johnny won the year that. What's this guy? Who's this big guy? This big rower guy, American national champion. 
what's his name? Brennan Wurtz. Brennan Wurtz. He should have done Worlds two years ago because there was not a yes. single climb. That's your Johnny Vermeesh one. I think, yeah. I think Johnny got he got that world championship and right under the line because I don't think he's, I think this course is a lot harder. So it's not good for Luke either. Yeah. I was going to say, we also have Quentin Ermans is someone I would watch. Jasper Stuyven. So Belgium coming in with a I mean, Tease Minute. Like, yeah, we got to, we have some serious hitters out there. Luke, of course, Greg Van Avermaet. I'm wondering if he'll still have a gold helmet in this race. What if he wins? And, and then that being, uh, that'd be might, incredible. He might come back on the road. Yeah. Like, it would just be like, hey, you're you're too good. You can't be retired. Yeah. Does he have? Does he have like in memoriam UCI start points? Will they grid him? And I have a feeling he'll get gridded. I think he'll be up there. I don't think you you don't you don't stick him in, in the back memoriam. Yeah. Um, do you think this list on cycling up to date? Pretty good website, by the way. Yeah. Is in the order in which they're starting. They're gridded. I am not sure. It certainly has that. How would would Peter Vakok be gridded fifth? That doesn't seem feasible. He doesn't have no. any UCI World Road points right now. Lawrence Sweek, another rider to watch. I mean, geez, this Belgium team is freaking stacked. So, why are there three hundred riders in this race? That's a question that I have. Seems well, I think I would assume there's a start fee. I think this is how they make money. This is the old fashioned okay. way of making money right. for a race. It's like everyone pays a start fee. Let's let as many people in as possible because we got to recoup our costs here. Okay. That'd be my guess is to watch yeah. 300. It's also, that's the spirit of gravel, right? You got 300 yeah, people totally. out on these loose roads. Will there be, are cars going to be driving around or are they actually going to close the road? We don't know. Probably they do close the roads in Europe. Yeah. That's a- Who... I, so who do you think is going to win the men's and then also the women's? Boy. Mohoric has had a terrible season and he's been out for the past two weeks. He had to miss the Road World Championship because he had a fall, as we discussed on the previous episode, at Girona UCI gravel race. And I think tore a lot of skin off of his hands, the gravel stigmata, as we call this affliction. I feel like he really needs this win. And is Matthew Vanderpool the clear favorite yes also you know with gravel it's it's a roll of the dice you can always fly off the road i'm gonna go with mate, mate. I, it feels it feels so be... so risky but i'm gonna go with mate yeah he said I, i'm curious to see if this gravel love affair continues he came in a hot ruler live 2024 talking big game uh, gravel's my main focus now cycling's my, my yeah. side squeeze it feels like it's taken a toll on him this year, especially that. I mean, we talked about it last year, that trip to unbound crashing yeah. at a Girona series. At some point, does, does the team sit him down and say, hey, man, we're paying you seven figures to race road races and right. this is affecting your performance? I don't know. I'm curious to see what happens in the offseason. What's going to happen at Ruler Live? Will he announce? I actually don't like gravel. I'm road now. Gravel sucks. I never liked it. But... No, I'm I'm curious to see who wins. I'm curious to see how the race, how the vibe around the race is. You know, is it are there a lot of fans out? Is it cool? They're, they've picked a great location for it. Like this is as good as it's ever going to be, probably location wise. The course, I do worry that it's too hard, like too technical, as you're saying. Like, is this just going to blow up immediately on the it single will. track? I think um, it I absolutely think will. Women's, I would. I would feel confident. This is Puck. Puck Peterson. Puck Peterser. How do we say her last name? We don't know. But Puck Peters. This is, this is her win. Like she's going to dominate this. Yeah, I. Yeah, I think that's highly likely. Likely, I think Allison Jackson. Oh, she's go. not the same level as. I Puck's one of the best bike handlers in the world and one of the strongest riders in the world. Anything can happen in a gravel race, I think, more so than in a road race. So I'm just saying, I think there's a chance. I would be shocked. Do we know the vert of this race? We is do. That, is that privileged information? While I'm looking that up, I think it's notable that Kasha Nui Adoma is saying, yeah, my season's over. I'm not showing up. I'm not defending my title. Yeah, she actually, she won it. She won a race, this, a road race this year. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know what? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I feel like this goes back to is Vanderpool even on the start line? Had he gotten the result he wanted at the Road World Championships? No way. 
he wouldn't no. be he wouldn't be doing yeah. this race. I mean, I have to say, there's a great Mohoric quote with regards to going toe to toe with Vanderpool this weekend, which is like, "Hey, Wild Van Art was there last year. He was the favorite. Look how it worked out." True. I think he crashed or something. I don't know. We don't know. It wasn't on TV, but I think he had some sort of misfortune, either yeah. flat or crash, which I guess yeah could will happen. Like a someone big will crash or flat at this race. We we may never know. The, it actually is harder to find the vertical gain for this course than you um, think. Okay, hold on. I want this in English. What have we got? Jeez. Distance. They don't really provide useful information on this site. We dug into this a couple of years ago. The whole... <laughs> the apparatus of the Gravel World Championship is a bit... It's on uh, shaky scaffolding. It doesn't quite have the level of professionalism that... no. Yeah, like basic information is missing. We don't know how much vert there is. I tell you what, the men's race is, and the women's race, these races are short relative to what these riders are used to doing. This is only 181 kilometers, which, and I think in the Colorado gravel community, that's considered a warm up. I mean, that's like what you do before work. Yeah, yeah that's like a like, Thursday training ride, I think. I mean, it does advantage the big stars so much yeah you know it because it like a professional and this is part of probably why keegan's not here partly like that's just not even the same sport that he's doing it's a sprint race yeah. it's like high high rev engine big watts i mean it's basically serving it up on a platter to the big roadies who can just put out so much power for that level for that distance I can't even honestly like I can't even tell what the vert is. So we have vert per lap. The laps are this can't be right. This is saying the lap is it's about 85 kilometers. Okay, and so there's probably a start loop plus two laps. I don't know what the vert is on the start loop on if you do two laps your vert's around 6000 feet. Wait, so hard, pretty hard. Yeah. I mean it's it's bumpy. For sure, it's going to be up and down all day, but it's, yeah, similar to BWR Kansas, kind of the gold standard and gravel at the world tour level. A lot of like punchy short climbs, not a lot of big climbs. I mean, that race might have been similar in distance. Yeah, actually. I yeah. Think it, yeah, I think it was. Interesting. Well, Andrew, I've got to go make the breakfast, get the kids to school. But thank Bid you. you. Peace so All right. much until and next time we'll be back next week to discuss this race that hopefully we see some of until then may the gravel spirit be with you <laughs>